And, and, uh, wait a minute. I can't hear myself. There we go. No? Check one, two, check one, two. Check three, four, check three, four. All right, there we go. And you don't get a much more appropriate introduction to audio than that, where we're running a sound check right off the bat. Uh, everybody, welcome. I am James Hearn, also known as Logic Hole, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, and welcome to the audio portion of Indie 3. Actually, I'm going to do just one thing, and I'll be right back. our dust as we get everything set up. Uh, this is going to be a little interesting because at the moment we've usually had three people here operating our broadcast and today, or for this, I am the only one. So I, it's a w bit of a one-man band. But as we do this, we've actually got some folks here in the mumble chat with us. So how about uh, you folks come and introduce yourselves? Hello? Absolutely. Hello. Hi. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I forgot to hit the button. Ah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, let's go and have everybody introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start. I'm Logical. I travel around the Seattle area broadca live broadcasting uh, fighting game tournaments, League of Legends tournaments, uh, different sorts of conventions doing similar things. And audio is actually a big part of the work that I do. If you look at uh, the stream here today, this is all running off my production. So, uh, it, so you've been listening to the fruits of that work uh, this whole this whole time. Uh, but so, uh, how about Winters pop in and introduce yourself yes. briefly? Well, you're doing a great job, man, because uh, I've been watching this stream a lot, and it's uh, been wonderful all day. And I am Winners with the One. I am the program director for the Independent Broadcast Network. You know us here at Hitbox as uh, slash IBN at Hitbox TV. And, but I'm also the audio engineer for a new game called Hashtag Wrecked from Hell Legit Games, which will be premiering at QuakeCon July 17th through 20th in Dallas, Texas, coming up very soon. Oh, so we are soon. very excited about that and excited to be on this really good panel, man. I've been talking to everybody uh, leading up to this, and we've got a, a lot of really cool guests uh, on this thing. So very excited to see what we come up with. Uh, that's great. We're glad to have you here. Uh, how about Svetlana pop in for a moment and say something? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm really nervous, so, but that's not my name. My name is Svetlana. I, oh. <laughs> uh, started <laughs> making music, <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> in 
no, really, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I started making music uh, really as a hobby since 2007, using trackers and all that, and, you know, software that nobody has been using since, I don't know, 20 years ago, because it wasn't necessary to use it anymore. But uh, I've sort of become a little specialized in vintage uh, sound hardware like the NES, the Amiga, and all that stuff. And it's really, uh, I feel like the least professional person here <laughs> because I haven't done a lot, like, in a very, uh, I haven't done a lot of big projects or anything. I just make it as a hobby. So if you think that you're not, uh, you're just starting out and you don't have a lot to your name, really don't need anything to start making music that's interesting we've i'm glad to hear that we've got a variety of experiences uh how about kermix pop in and say a little Hi bit there. yeah um uh, well just as as uh, jeb Rance just said in the chat we are all unprofessional here so there's nothing yeah, really to worry all, about there we all start from nothing and then see where we go from there our different paths so, see where it takes us yeah, so I'm I'm Kermit. That's my real name. Ah, okay. After the after the after the frog, uh, I go by Kermix. I also go by Krill Factor on Twitter. Um, most of the, I'm a basically lifetime musician. I grew up playing instruments and and listening to stuff. And I have the ear. My dad and I both have the ear. It's insane. Um, most of my experience creating electronic music was like Svetlana on trackers in the mm, mid nineties. Okay. We can probably, we can probably both go into detail on what those are if anybody cares. Um, but also a little bit of, um, uh, learn, I've basically been teaching myself, uh, the basics of, of audio production over the last couple of years and finally got some stuff on Bandcamp, which is awesome. Um, it's, it's a pretty good resource for, for people who have already made stuff and want to put it out there as well as SoundCloud, but we can all, we can throw out a bunch of links to that stuff later. Anyway, um, that's basically it. I haven't actually put anything into into anybody else's projects, but I am eager to do so at some point. I would really like to see some of the, some of the stuff that I and these other people have made go into go into indie games. Anyhow, yeah, that's great. And then I believe we've got one more whose name I'm not sure how to pronounce. It starts with an S. It's <laughs> Flani. It's a uh, large barn for. Well, as I say, it's recorder is quite literally annoying flute. Um, I've been uh, doing music since 2004 at high school and started getting into trackers sort of around 05. Um, oh, so trackers all around. Yeah, uh, so I was going to use Fast Tracker too, but it wouldn't work. So then I tried out Impulse Tracker and it did. So I'm pretty, I've been using that format for quite a while now. Um, I've... I'm also a programmer. Um, I've actually written a fair amount of uh, play routines for <laughs> all these formats and stuff like that. Uh, most for PC, some for weird game consoles. <laughs> but yeah. And I am currently uh, unemployed. Um, not actually ever actually entered employment yet. So I'm trying to sort of self employ myself and hopefully get somewhere. It yeah, doesn't get much more indie than that. Uh, so, as kind of a topic for this roundtable discussion, let's talk a little bit about sound design and games and, you know, what we see that works and what, what doesn't. Uh, so, maybe Winters will pop in uh, kind of well, and start that. Kind of, uh, as I'd say, probably the, the most professional of this group. You know, kind of what have you seen? What do you think that we indies could be doing better? What are we doing well? Oh, I don't know if I would say I'm the most professional of this group, but we were talking earlier about how important sound is to a game project. And sometimes it's the most underlooked thing when you come down to what actually is being worked on in a project. And so you see that uh, happen in a lot of titles, but then we all can name, I mean, everybody in the chat too, I'm sure, can name games where audio really meant a lot to them as far as how the game resonated with them. And so I think it uh, 
it's one of those things that is overlooked more than it should be. And so I'm hoping we can kind of touch on some of that because I think it's uh, it's definitely something you, that can add so much to your game. And you may not even realize it at the time, but people who are on the end of it who are playing these games, they will definitely notice. Absolutely. Well, uh, well I'd, be, I'd be happy to play the counterpoint to that argument because I think that's actually been changing a lot in the last uh, five or ten years or so. There's been a lot more attention to it, I think, or at least uh, like a lot more um, just kind of dynamic stuff that, that actually fits the mood. I mean, the, the thing that impre- – and, and I know this isn't indie, but I have to say it because it impressed the heck out of me at the time uh, when Portal 2 first hit, and I was listening to it and, and, Ooh, and yeah. listening to the audio while I was playing along, and I realized that different cues were happening in time, like, like as, you, as you did things within the game. There were different channels going up and down. There were, uh, like, different... As different parts of the of the of the music were coming in and out as as different things were happening, um, I think it would be great to have a lot more dynamic audio like that. Uh, and it is it's possible more so now I think than before. Um, in fact, if you go back to oh gosh, sorry guys, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get a hold on you here for a second. Back in the 80s or 90s, I guess it was the 90s when uh, when Lucas Arts was still a thing, when they were still making adventure games back in the early Monkey Island days and all of that stuff. Uh, they had what they called the iMuse system, and it was basically you know general MIDI, but it was cued so that whenever whenever you changed a scene, it would try to make a smooth transition. And they actually they actually bothered to program that in. Okay, that was impressive to me as well. So. And and maybe that's harder with uh, with like static files that are just that are. I think we lost you there. Uh, jumping anyway, back. I think there's a lot more potential for it now than there used to be. Yes, oh, it, I think it, it definitely can be done now. I'm sorry if I'm cutting anyone. I just I wanted to add that. Nope, your turn. <laughs> Um, it's something that I, yeah, I remember also in adventure games and all that, they had the music that would change with each action that you made and all that. Uh, it's certainly something that could be, uh, revisited in games today and should be really. Um, and it, it's something that really can be made today. Uh, there's really no reason why people don't make it. Mm-hmm. I, jumping back a moment in the conversation uh, about how uh, developers have been paying more or less attention these days uh, is that, you know, with sound sometimes, it's easy to be overlooked because when it's, when it's working properly, you don't really notice. It's only when things are kind of broken that people start paying Thank attention. You. And or if you're just too slack to actually add it in mm-hmm. and... Uh, yeah, you do actually notice it. Mm, there could be some sound here. Yep, there could be some sound, or... Uh, like, in terms of things I do for this broadcast right here, it's pretty subtle, but when you... W- I've got auto-ducking on kind of the imported game audio, so when people start talking, the audio goes down. When they stop, it comes back up. and just makes for a smoother experience for our viewers. Uh, and, and that's a good thing to, to kind of dovetail into is just the, is is that there's also sound effects and everything else mm-hmm. to factor in and the, and the way that it's all mixed. And I don't envy anybody who has to do that. Yeah, it, it's a lot of work. I'm, I'm actually trying something new for this weekend where I'm actually uh, applying some equalization on a lot of the audios to get it out of the way of the vocal ranges so that our speakers, speakers all come through more clearly. Stuff like that. Uh, oh, that's of, hot. Yeah, I had yeah a, it, I, it's... It, it, it's very subtle, but it actually has made a huge difference in the clarity of our audio for everybody watching this weekend. High pass, low pass, they are your friends. Absolutely. I used to know some people, and I used to know some uh, sound engineers in Santa Barbara that would that would do that to their to their giant speakers for like outdoor parties and stuff, so that people could still talk over the music. It was so. Oh, rad. that's really clever for live. Yes, they were Ooh, really like good that. at it. They were really good at it, and I I could not even understand how they did it. I'd say uh, uh, band stop, also known as Notch, is also quite good if your hardware's a bit crap. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, been pretty pleased. Uh, I, I always I find myself these days watching a lot of broadcasts uh, just to listen to them, even if I don't follow the game, just to see what they're doing. 
it's uh, it's been interesting. So, uh, so those are kind of ex some techniques or things we've been trying here. Uh, but like, what would you like to see in in games? Di so dynamic music that kind of reflects the gameplay and the experience is definitely one that I think we've seen some movements toward that. Like you mentioned in Portal Two, uh, maybe there are some other examples, but. Uh, what do you, what kind of gameplay experiences do you think that we could emphasize or or add to? Well, I can't help but think that it depends a lot on what kind of game you're making and what sort of uh, emotions and what what the evocative uh, notions that you're trying to bring out. And for some things, it's more of an ambient sort of thing. And for hashtag wrecked, I know that musically we're going for, it's an old style arena shooter. Mm -hmm. So if you remember a lot of your, your quake and unreal, you know, you had Trent Reznor and you had oh, some yes. really hard drum and bass and I, kind of metally kind of things I, going on. I so we're going for that in high school that would just put the quake game CD <laughs> in their car yes, and drive around yes. town listening to quake and so on. Yeah, but but if we were doing a you know a roguelike or a side scroller or some of our other games we're working on, such as uh, Cult of the Chrome Sphere, that's uh, more of a uh, retro rock kind of thing mm -hmm. going with that. But yeah, it's it, a lot of it depends on what you're going for with your game. And some of these games that people are bringing up here and in chat, I think are are just good examples of uh, where they really hit that right note, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the game as you know with what they're trying to do musically and just kind of bring those things out because like you say it's it's another kind of art it's like painting you don't want to splash on too much you want to bring out the things that you want to uh, emphasize in the game like a painting yeah uh, i'll bring in another example that i've been thinking about i play a lot of rhythm games personally uh very kind of musically Ooh. oriented and yep. one that has really impressed me recently is the final fantasy theater rhythm game on the 3ds where they take a bunch of Final Fantasy music from the years, of which y there's no shortage of choices, and they have you know various motions and stuff you do to play along with the note tracks for the game. But what impressed me about this game, as opposed to a lot of rhythm games, is that for every notated note that you play, or every slide, or 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 sweep, or tap, or whatever, you get basically uni a unique percussion sound from the game. So it's like you're playing a, a percussion accompaniment to the game. Uh, whereas with a lot of music games, it's either the audio cuts out if you miss it, a la like Guitar Hero or Rock Band, or you get a squeak sound, or some, something else to indicate that, oh, you've messed up. And here, it's very much, rather than that negative reinforcement, it's very positive reinforcement. You hear yourself playing, performing, along with the music. And Logic speaking, felt, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. I felt like that was just a huge enhancement to the gameplay experience and good design in general. Have you uh, seen the, um, I guess it's a, a fairly new thing on Steam, uh, Cosmic DJ? Are you familiar um, with this? The name is yes. familiar, but I really don't know anything about it. I saw, I only got to see it projected against a wall last night uh, at the at the well in L.A. where uh, I, I actually got, uh, Zoe mentioned something last night about uh, about um, Future Crew, and I was like, I remember that name, I've got to go. But, uh, but, I, but they had uh, in the... Outside on the wall, they had this game Cosmic DJ projected there, and you mentioned rhythm games, and it, and it reminded me of that. And it was that was a, I, it was it was pretty interesting in the in that they had all like a whole bunch of different uh, mm. sets of of different types of, of samples to to pick from, and and basically construct both the beat and the and the audio and the the, the sounds above it, mm. and just and yeah, just the, it it seemed very difficult. From from what I saw, to make something bad with it, I, I think it was, okay. I think they did a pretty good pick of that. So we might want to look at that. Yeah, uh, at some point. You know, I was. I believe that is uh, being published by our good friends at Devolver Digital. Definitely friends of uh, yes. indie yeah. gaming. That's the one. Shout out to Fort Parker. Okay. Uh, apparently, I have lost. I have lost my access to the chat for the moment while my Wi-Fi reconnects. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, but you know. I saw another game recently, or played another game recently, for the Cascadia Tour, uh, which was Res, which yes. actually, you know, oh, yeah. famous, famous music, uh, it's not really a rhythm game, but it's it's a musically uh, inspired game, and there are some things in it that are, that are interesting, like in the gameplay, this every time you, you hold 
your button down to, to lock on to targets to things, when you, those make sound effects. And when you release to fire your missiles, that also makes sound effects. But the sound effects don't happen exactly when you press the button. They are timed to the beat of the music. So you'll be sitting here playing and there's no enemies and you're just tapping on the button with the beat. And even if you're not, you are not on the beat, the, the sounds will be on the beat. And it's, act it's subtle, but it, you feel very rhythmic rhythmically inclined. It, that, I thought, was an interesting touch. And not to mention that whatever form your avatar is in or whatever level you're on, the sounds all change to reflect the music that is being performed through the level. Uh, I've so. got a, a sort of a question um, or, or something that mm -hmm. I kind of wonder. A lot of... Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of games these days, the music is just a sort of an AUG or an MP3 or maybe even mm -hmm. a WAV file if they haven't even thought that one through. Um, so Unity what, supports like, mods. Ah, oh, that's, that's kind of good. Uh, what play nice. is that? What, what, what? say make mod. Make, I'd rather make mod than mod plug. What, well, really? Well, so so are we going to go, are we going to talk about DOSBox ST3? Are we going to go that way? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's do it. History. Retro's All been right. growing lately. Let's hear the it. The gauntlet has been thrown. Wait, so it's that's... certainly something that I would like to see revived. I because, I mean, a... with... Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I think, really, the the plus side with mods, n not even just mods themselves, like, not the, the original file format, but, like, f other formats uh, made... Uh, based on the first one, like today you have uh, Modplug or Renoise, and... So just, just, to, just to clear this up for the audience, you're talking about, uh, about music, made from, and... music made from samples, for those who don't understand what that yes, is. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the point I, I was going to make is that on those files, instead of like an mp3 where you have the entire song laid out and uh, you can't really change the, the music, uh, with a module file, it's like a MIDI in the sense that the notes are there and you can change each note individually in each track and channel and all that. But you also have samples, so the upside uh, from MIDI to modules is that it sounds the same in any system if you're using the same replayer. So it adds flexibility to the music, so you can turn off a channel in the game like the same thing that you you had in, in those adventure games 20 years ago you can do that with mods and stuff like that so it's certainly a format that i wish more people would use over uh stream formats like og or mp3 that is and i and i think that's a an interesting point to bring up because it is but uh the there are several formats that are all kind of uh they all kind of evolved out of, I guess, Amiga mods, and um, they, it, it, yeah, at the time, the the benefit was uh, was that it sa was that it was a sample, so it had the exact sound that you were looking for. It wasn't whatever MIDI people had on their computer at the time, and because they were little tiny samples, you didn't have a huge long file. You just had all the little samples, and they were played back at different speeds. And I do, I do kind of think that there's. It would be interesting to see to see a a modern format uh, based on that something the something an updated version. I've been using um, Sunvox, but it's not an open format, and I think and also it's uh, uh, it's um, one where you join these sorts of well blocks or something and you link them up together so it's not strictly sampled. Uh, I've heard a mod plugger working on, or have been working on their own extension of the IT format, uh, but that's all I've really heard on that front. Although IT wasn't that bad because it was 16-bit samples, so maybe all we need is a is a is somebody to code a a more updated, streamlined uh, tracker for it. If I were to if I were to do a rewrite of uh, if I were to um do something based on IT except uh, cleaned up, I'd probably change the way the effects work because a lot of them are quite antiquated, a lot of uh, backwards compatibility 
mm. with uh, SRM and mod. Yeah, I, um, I forgot all about effects, and yeah, so that's that's a that's a good argument for for uh, for an upgrade. One of the great things about the IT format, though, is it added um, in two point one four patch three. They added uh, resonant filters. It's just a low pass filter, but if you want to do a high pass, you just um, duplicate the sample, invert the waveform, and filter one of them. Oh right. I want to I want to keep talking about this, but I think we're losing the audience here. I don't think they've been following <laughs> oh. all this stuff. Well, it's definitely you'll, you'll inspired me because I haven't because my Wi-Fi just died, so I can't see the chat any longer. Oh no. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't used a mod tracker in years, but I'm kind of inspired to again now, just uh, listening to you guys talk. Because yeah, you can still do a lot of stuff with those things, and you know the they worked. Uh, people made uh, miraculous things years ago, doing a, a lot with a little. And I think the that's closest, kind of what it's about. I, I think, think the closest parallel now is sound fonts, and those are a little bit complicated, but I, but it's still based on uh, on full samples. Yeah, and that's vestigial <laughs> sound blaster stuff. Yeah, yeah so. I, that, I thought of I heard the name of sound fonts, and I immediately thought of trying to get the original Final Fantasy VII PC port working with MIDI on my oh. computer back in like <laughs> like 97, 98, something like that. That's about how long it's been since I've heard of heard sound. The great thing <laughs> about about uh, about music as iconic as that is it all you have to do is say that and it just pops right in my head yep. just instantly. Yep. It's insane how that happens, but that's that's how our brains work. They love music and they can't forget it. Yeah, it, it's, it's the power of music. It seems like it's linked directly mm -hmm. into your memory and emotion. Uh and when you have there a moment and it's, and it's connected with the music, then yeah, you absolutely uh, tap directly into that. Indies, pay attention. You too can have this power. Uh, well, I think, uh, you may have missed it in the chat, Desire but I know that some people us. were asking. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, <laughs> I know some people were asking earlier, and since we're getting off into uh, uh, how we do this stuff, uh, some people were asking about the process. You know, if you were wanting to get into doing sound, what would you uh, recommend well, that people use? I can talk about and there are so many things. I mean, there's so many ways to do yeah, this. So. And I, yeah, so we've got folks here who are focused on the music production side. I, I could talk about how I got into streaming and sound because I started with nothing and learned as I went. Uh, so I don't know. Where do you think we want to start? Well, there I are could... two directions. One is music theory, and one is just straight um, audio. So I don't know. All right. Well, and then um, there's banging on the keyboards without yes, any direction whatsoever, an, which is the way technique. that I went. That is an important <laughs> technique. I'd say um, for audio, well, for sound effects, if you're in a pinch, your voice will do. Mm -hmm. You know, That's I, true. That's actually a really good point. I've actually uh, made some sounds that way because, uh, yeah, there, there's all sorts of stuff. If you want to do the mod trackers, I kind of live in Ableton a lot in the things that mm -hmm. I do. It, it's such a, uh, a, a closed garden of, you know, goodies that you can mm -hmm. use. I mean, <laughs> and, and I use the tone generation from that a lot. For mm -hmm. hashtag wrecked, I know some of you were tuning in to get some hashtag wrecked news. Here's something for you. Uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of the sound effects stuff, and what I find I'm using a lot is just uh, layering samples that are uh, stomped upon and, and crushed and uh, pulled every which way like taffy and uh, layered to make new sounds. And then you, you find things that kind of grab people's ear, and you alter those and, and uh, pack them together in ways that make new sounds, along with, yeah, just using straight tone generators from uh, your various synthesis tools, which uh, a big resource is uh, VSTs, which are basically plugins that you can get. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the best ones are available for free, folks. Yeah, and you I, just go to the internet. You can use something like Reaper, mm -hmm. which is also actually, more or less free. And then you yeah. choose your VST plugins, and you can do so much with that. Yeah, I'll jump in I'm a second. Reaper monkey. Yep, I am running this broadcast right now with Reaper. Uh, Excellent. Oh, let's see. Oh, uh, there we go. There we go. That's that's us live right now. You can watch the you can watch the needles jump as we speak. Uh, <laughs> um, that yeah. doesn't run an Amiga. Uh, <laughs> You're all fakers. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 what can I say? Uh, Reaper, I I can recommend, especially because the the trial version is fully enabled, and there's not a time limit or anything. 
the, just a, a five second pop up that says, "Hey, this this actually costs I think what what is it fifty dollars, which is absolutely reasonable compared to yeah, I think a lot it was about sixty five, sixty well yeah, something like that. I think I paid something like sixty for it, and that's yeah. after I had been using it for a year, and I realized I've been using this more than a lot of things I paid a lot more for, so I should send the money because it's really good. Right. Yeah, that's like the price you pay for one AAA game. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and uh, let me let me kind of jump off of that into uh, the the angle of, of synthesizers and stuff because there's VSTs out there that are free VSTs mm -hmm. that are that are synths. Now the for the for the studious person who wants to know everything and anything about synthesizers, there is a fantastic um, to the. Uh, series of articles online called synth secrets i don't know if you've heard of this oh no that's new to me i'll put a link in the chat it's oh, yeah, a, it's on a, it's on it's on sound sound on sound.com if i remember right i got it open in another tab but i have to take my finger off the push to talk button in order to get to it but it's it's a it's at least 40 or 50 uh articles in in uh succession that just go detail by detail about fm synthesis about how it works about how uh, what each different thing does. It, it's it's a real ridiculously thorough course in how to make noise. Mm. And it, and I love the dang thing. I haven't finished it yet, but I, I really want to go all the way through it because going going through that with uh, with a VST for that emulates like an old uh, Mini Moog or or Arp Odyssey, something you know something that's that's basically iconic. Uh, okay. There's a lot you can do with those, okay. and if you and if you and if you know what you're doing, it's it's fantastic just for making all sorts of sound effects and not just music. Okay, that is really interesting because you know sound effects are something that I have been personally very weak at. And I'd I'd love to to introduce some sound effects to some of the work I'm doing to get a soundboard and and be able to do more stuff live. That would be that would be pretty cool. Well, what Fancy was saying about just using your voice, uh, that yeah. sometimes that's enough. Uh, there was an old Bee Gees song called Tragedy, and there's a big explosion in the middle. I remember seeing mm -hmm. the making of Tragedy, and it was just one of the brothers Gibb going, you know, into the mm -hmm. microphone. And they just kind of uh, embellished that with uh, various effects and EQs and stuff. And, and sometimes uh, you can do a lot just with things like that. Uh, j the human voice... Uh, you know, beatboxing can okay. uh, or is a good jump off point for a lot of sound effect type ideas, even if it's just sort of uh, sort, sort of, uh, you know, whiteboard kind of ideas that you can uh, build from. Oh, and there's a lot of smartphone apps out that, that do all sorts of weird musical stuff, too. And I haven't I haven't looked at a lot of them because I don't have a smartphone right now. But I know that they're out there and I know <laughs> that a bunch of them are really cool and can export to whatever format you need. And who knows, maybe some of that can at the very least give you some ideas, if not be fully, you know, game ready. Hmm. No, I, got, I, I think I, I think a lot of those research. Chat, so I'm getting caught up. Oh, cool. I think I think a lot of those resources, though, are also for people who are who are already sort of creatives or come up with ideas while they're not in the house. But mm -hmm. that's that's also a good tool for for musicians who want to be able to you know, record their stuff while while they're you know, not in front of the computer so that they can remember it later. You know, I think one thing a lot of people c could consider, too, uh, talking f to folks who, who don't really want to learn how to produce their own sound is to look at some of the indies out there who are producing and hire them. A friend of mine, Robert Boyd, over at Zaboy Games, did, uh, he did Cthulhu Saves the World and the yes. Rain Slick Games 3 and 4, and uh, I could talk about him all, how, about him all day. We've, yeah, we, but I, we I were roommates in college, actually. And, <laughs> and, but he uh, went to, I need to ask him who it was, but he like paid a flat $40 for royalty free music for his game. And so many folks playing the game were like, this music is the greatest. And, and he had bought it from an indie and it, it worked out really well for him at, you know, very reasonable prices, even on those tiny, tiny indie budgets. Mm hmm um, and then as he got more success, I, these days I think he's working with HyperDuck Chris as, as his budget has grown, that sort of thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So I think if, if you're worried about music for your game, it, it, you don't need, necessarily need to be intimidated by it if you don't think you're a composer. But there are options out there. 
It's yeah, like, I think a lot of it's just yeah. getting over some your of them fear are in this of. Room. Yeah, some of yeah. them are in this room. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Constantly and, and, and our own staring stuff. Staring to your souls. <laughs> you do realize I actually made a program. I'm also known as Grease Monkey. Uh, it sometimes crops up in Ludum Dare entries. It's called Auto Tracker. So if you really, really desperately need music, it pops out stuff that's okay. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> if you want something better, feel <laughs> free to hire one of us. Yeah, I was going to say that absolutely. was a, that was a pretty solid endorsement for okay music. Yes, okay, okay. But still, yes, all the different tools, very good to have, and and yes, especially in the indie community, I think it'd be, I think it's great to to, uh, I guess it's technically hiring within the company is really what it is. Mm-hmm. And we're you you guys are out. We're sort of in a golden age of having all this stuff available to us. I mean, when you start talking about things like your Amigas and your Atari STs and, and your mod trackers and so, you know, that stuff is still available to us now, but there are also all these other things. And, and so there's a, it, it's almost overwhelming the, uh, the wealth of uh, stuff that we have to utilize to make these kinds of sounds now. So yeah, a lot of it is uh, for people that are, if the question is, how do I get into this stuff? I guess it's just fool around with different things. And because the main thing is finding something that works for your workflow. Mm-hmm. And none of us can really answer that for you, what works best for you. I mean, even in something like Ableton or Reaper, you'll see 10 different people do something 10 different ways mm-hmm. to get to the same end result. And, mm-hmm. Oh, and software. so a lot of it's just, yeah, finding a workflow that's good for you. Now, I can hardware geek with the best of them, dude. I have two Insonic Mirages and a Roland Juno 1 sitting right here. But uh, and, and some of which will end up in hashtag wrecked, I'm sure, one way or the other. But, you know, not for everybody that can't uh, get their hands on vintage synthesizers or equipment, there is uh, emulation and there's just stuff you can get for free that, you know, you don't even have to pay a dime for or very little for that. It has the kind of power that once you would have to go into a full-fledged studio to get so so really if you're wanting to get into this sort of stuff this is a really good time in history to do it, it I, think. Is. I uh i know that i personally uh i try to avoid the desire to collect hardware because when i do a show i, I have to carry it all to my car and carry it out and set it up and then a few hours later pack it up again and head home uh <laughs> and Hardware, so I am doing an awful lot in software. I'm going to I'm gonna break the illusion for a second because nobody's here to stop me. But you look over oh. at the studio here, I give it a second, you can kind of see what I'm working with. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in. I've got my audio interface here in my in my project box, but that's pretty oh, much... Oh, we got to... Oh, pimp the gear. That's pretty much the only piece of... Uh, serious hardware or or the only piece of really strong audio hardware that i'm using the rest of it is in software ah, i have this I is have a historic very... moment folks we're seeing behind the scenes footage yeah i i have it a, really I breaks have, the immersion yeah I, I, I have ruined my, my very yeah. carefully uh maintained i illusion. thought you were really in space you know, you really uh, I'm really for me. Out I could be. I'll, I'll, I'll hold up a, a red blinky light and mind wipe everybody watching. But <laughs> yeah, pay no pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Oh, you broke it. I, I know, I know, it's broken. Sorry to <laughs> sorry to disappoint everybody. <laughs> Indy three is ruined. Yeah, no. Go home. Indy Christmas three is canceled. Our, 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 uh, we're not actually in a five million dollar recording studio. We're in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's how we were able to do this on such short notice is because I, I, I kind of do this on a regular basis and we just uh, upgraded we we just decided to go big for this I feel kind of honored that we, <laughs> we, that all of us that are in this panel only knew that we were going to be in it about like what an hour and a half ago yes and, yeah. Yeah. And we're the ones to break the seal we're the ones to <laughs> Pull away the curtain and see what's really happening out there. Uh, yeah, I don't no, want it's, to. it's been, it, it, this has been an incredible run the last few days. Uh, the idea for this uh, conference was floated on Thursday, and it so happens that 
Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I was working probably 60 hours those few days on the Battle for Seattle, which is my event that I ran on Saturday. So then on Sunday, i.e., the day before we went live at 10 a.m. on Monday, I was able to actually start working on this event. <laughs> and it, it, it's, been, it's been interesting. It's been well, tell us a little bit about that uh, battle about in Seattle, man. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, what kind of uh, games and stuff are you doing? What kind of uh, audio setup are you running for that? Okay, uh, the Battle for Seattle is a fighting game tournament. Uh, we, awesome. We started it a, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, with some folks who were in the, the quote-unquote Air Dasher anime fighting game community because we didn't have any tournaments for those in the area, uh, just for Capcom games like Street Fighter or Marvel vs. Capcom, stuff like that. So, but we, we played Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear and Persona 4 Arena, and you even get into the smaller stuff like Melty Blood or Arcana Heart or all those things, and they didn't have tournaments. Like, maybe once a year there was Northwest Majors, but that was an annual, not a monthly. And so myself and some folks said, okay, let's let's do it ourselves, and here we go. I ended up coming on for that. I started streaming for that event, and that's huh. where I started. And, you know, from there it's just been the process of every time I do something, I go and I, I as I'm as I'm going through it is... I take notes on what's working, what's not. Actually, uh, some folks just arrived. Hey, David, hand me that black notebook over there. All right, more illusion breaking. I've, I've, I've got <laughs> notes <laughs> on everything that's been working or not working with this event. Uh, and actually, after we go dark tonight, I'm going to go uh, adjust some things, just like I do after every show. If you don't want to break the illusion, get a green notebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this, thing, this, is, this is pretty great. Black notebook, very handy. Uh, but that's where I started basically, and I started with uh, a couple of uh, lapel headphones and uh, a, a, a USB mixer that I got, and that that was where I started. And as I've gone up these days, I am running uh, these Audio Technica headsets, which are pretty reasonably priced for how well they do. And I'm running into a 16-channel, 8-in, 8-out audio interface, which feeds into Reaper, which feeds into OBS. And, oh, okay. And that's how I'm pulling this off. I'm running four mics, and then I've got four channels, which are devoted to stereo. Uh, two for my digital HDMI capture, which feeds into there. And then I've got two, which are for when I'm capturing from, like, a Wii or some other strictly analog source as opposed to a digital one and all those feed into reaper uh feed into reaper and actually hey david could you highlight that layer in obs and hit control f or highlight the layer that says uh in in that scene what do you see oh this is going to be uh yeah uh just just uh go through them i'll hit control f Wait, uh, uh, more illusion breaking. Well, that, that's well, what happens. But you're you're kind of making the point that we were making earlier, which is that all this stuff is available to people yeah, now. Uh, I mean, you would go. have had to go to a big TV studio yeah. to do this kind of stuff before. Right, you're you're able now to do fits. right here from your from your house. You're yeah, able I'm, to do yeah, this, this uh, high level production. When when I travel, it uh it all fits in the back of my Subaru. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm not carrying a whole studio around. <laughs> You know, I, I don't need oh, yeah. a, a team of roadies to, to go do a show. Yeah, so... But it yeah. certainly would help. Yeah, yeah. I, and a <laughs> lot of that software is freely available, especially when you're getting started out. And there are some good guides online for the hardware end, starting reasonably. I know a lot of folks start out with, like, the $50 Blue Snowball USB mics because, you, you know, we're talking start with your voice. That's a really good entry-level point for working with voice. Or you could get a Sony FV220 or a Sony FV120 or something. Those, I think, are even cheaper. And the uh, handheld unidirectionals, and they're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, or you can do like me and have the same microphone you've had for like 10 years, and it's not even USB or anything. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you like have a preference in headphones, Svetlana? 
whatever's cheapest is usually good. I, <laughs> no, I, um, uh, right now I'm using one that's not exactly the cheapest that I had, but it's it's a funny story because the ones that I used to have were the good ones, and then I got new ones, which sound like shit. So what I did was cut up the two of them and make one that worked better. Mm. And it just really because uh, I'm not, I don't have exactly uh, access to any, you know, fancy stuff, names and all that. Mm. Everything I own is like nameless Chinese stuff. So really, don't look at me if you're looking for, you know, quality hardware. But you know, uh, just I end up hacking together whatever I can find. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for headphones, I can actually make a recommendation that's really easy to make. Uh, I, uh, the These headphones here, uh, the Audio-Technica M40 FSs, are, mm-hmm. are, are like super common uh, studio headphones, and they're about 60 bucks. They, they, oh, they retail for 180 but I've never not seen them on sale for 60 uh, <laughs> And so I actually cart around three pairs of these or when I'm doing something, just because it's so useful to have them like listening to different mixes, or I want to bring somebody in and say, hey, listen to this, or we're interviewing somebody and we temporarily need some headphones for them to listen to so we can hand them a microphone and they can hear what's going on, stuff like that. That's awesome. Uh, I'm yeah, going to have to check yeah. those out. Yeah, uh, those for me, really, I use uh, really Plantronics because they've been to the moon and back. Mm-hmm. So as far as gaming, they're a pretty safe bet. Um, they're for mastering, certified. I use the uh, Grado Labs SR60s. Okay, and yep. they are wonderful. Yep, the Grados are good, good headsets. For me, I just go with um. Well, I've got these DSC, got this DSC headset, and the mic's pretty good, and the speakers are crap. So I tend to go, um, but I've got another set of just straight headphones. Yeah, my my ATs like are like that. Ones. The the mic is solid, but I mean, I can I can listen to things, but I'm not going to do any mixing or any kind of critical listening on these headsets. Yeah, I have yet to buy. I have yet to buy a professional microphone of any sort, but I have recorded my voice one time in a, in a track that I was doing, and I and I was doing it on just like a little clip mic that came with something, mm-hmm. and I was like, this sounds horrible, but I decided to uh, kind of let, to just get creative with that. And instead of letting it sound horrible, I just put it in, into a bunch of effects and made it sound like I was talking through a phone, and it actually worked <laughs> out really well. <laughs> So, well, if you, it, so if you have to go cheap, you can still do something creative and it can still come out good. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's something I really want to speak to, guys. I'm seeing Brilliant say something here. Technological limitations should not stand in the way of good ideas. Absolutely. And I just want to Absolutely. reiterate that because that's something, you know, like Svetlana says, you don't need great hardware. And we see a lot of people kind of get intimidated by this stuff because if you go in forums, they'll say, well, you really need these Five hundred dollars Sennheisers, oh, yeah. or you might if as well just go, quit. Stop yeah. reading gear sluts. Stop yeah, reading exactly. it. Don't, don't read those <laughs> forums. That, 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 that Kanye is a forum West for started making <laughs> music on a talk cheap... about music rather than make music, and I'm going to make a lot yeah. of enemies saying that. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but, Yeezy started on a karaoke machine, yeah, just yeah. Uh, just making beats on that. And, and you know, no matter how terrible it sounded, it's that will to do things mm-hmm. that really has to overcome things. There are people that talk about stuff, and then there are people that do stuff. And, and so you it, shouldn't yeah. let the uh, the technological. Uh, limitations that you might have in front of you you might be able to do mm-hmm. a lot with what you've got sitting in front of you right now yeah, i think I, if anybody knows that point at uh, better than indies i don't know who it is yeah there, a little bit of creativity goes a long <laughs> way I, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to folks who are doing streaming or let's plays or so on and Ooh. but yeah because that's the community i'm coming more from uh solon who is hosting this do an amazing job of hosting this whole thing and organizing uh, I was introduced at a, at a critical gaming conference here that a friend of mine took me to, and he's like, you might find this interesting, because he knew that I do broadcast stuff. And I went there, and it was uh, a fun time, and met a lot of interesting people, especially from University of Washington, who I had not met before, and that's kind of how I got drawn into this whole event, was through uh, knowing him, and we you know, really kind of respected each other's work. But, but yeah, it, it, Content is king. Uh, ideas really matter. And if, like, you can improvise techniques, and if it doesn't work as much as you want, you know, figure something out for next time. 
but don't let that stop you from doing it this time uh, because I'd rather do something 10 times and get a little bit better each time than try to make it a massive improvement one time, you know? Something I'd like to tackle, we're talking about inexpensive stuff. Are there any Linux users, or if you're weird like me, do you use BSD or anything Ooh. like that? Oh, wow. Um, I am an old school Unix guy. I actually uh, started out, uh, I'm actually, I'm, you know, professionally, I'm a software engineer. I've been a Linux guy since 99, so, you know, I'm one of those guys out here. I think I started programming in 2000, so you probably... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've done a lot of big iron administration stuff for, like, Fortune 100 companies and so on. That's, you know, even more behind the curtain, right? Uh, but, but, but go on, go on. Yeah, um, kind of want... Uh, I have actually used it for making stuff. Uh, uh, one thing that does annoy me is, uh, okay, there's this lovely sound API called Jack. It yep, runs on Linux. Sure. It also runs on BSD. Yeah. Uh, you can uh, programs that use it well can just link up to things, mm -hmm. and uh, and you can also tr uh, sort out uh, the MIDI sort of side quite mm -hmm. easily and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, generally, what what I do is I, uh, for quite some time, I actually just uh, sorry, words aren't quite coming out. Um, main reason why I'm using BSD at the moment is actually because of a few pieces of software that most uh, mainstream Linux distros have that I hate. Mm -hmm. One of them is Pulse Audio. Oh, oh yeah. Let's not get into oh. Pulse Audio. I could talk for a while. <laughs> yeah, we should probably not talk about Pulse Audio other than I highly recommend that you just uh, kill it off when you're um, doing <laughs> sound stuff. <laughs> and also, Jack is fantastic, and you should have a look into that. But uh, a lot of your programs won't. Well, if you're doing anything, I guess, live, you could possibly shove something into Jack Rack mm -hmm. and actually auto tune and reverb live. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I've, I've actually tried that with uh, Jack for Windows and, and ran into a brick wall and, and gave it up in favor of just hardware loopbacks, uh, oh, right. which is what I ended up doing. Uh, oh, you know, in the chat here, we've got somebody asking, what camera are we using? And the answer is, I, f I got on eBay a... I can't use the camera to show you the camera, huh? That doesn't work. But Do it. Uh, you have a mirror? Use a mirror. Oh, you yeah. know, I don't have a handheld mirror or anything. Unless my my house gets get a here. screwdriver, I I how would a screwdriver help? I I'm not seeing the logic either. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can remove the mirror from the wall. Oh, uh, wow, I just oh, made a really yeah, bad pun and didn't even try to. That's I'm like sorry. A, a, like a uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've I, I'm using so. like uh, okay. an older uh, Canon Vixia HV40. And I got it cheaply because it only writes to tape. It doesn't write to flash card. But since I'm doing live, I just run the HDMI out and capture that. So it's worked pretty well for me. I've got a wide-angle wide, wide angle lens on it. Uh, the lens matters a lot more than the body, in my opinion. And I, I've got just a lot of lighting in this room here. It is extremely warm with all of the heat from the lights. Uh, but So that's what I'm using for the camera. And then, you know, like anything... Learn a little bit about how your hardware works, and yeah, yeah. Hmm. What, what, what am I doing? I'm being handed. Oh. Uh. Uh. uh it's hard to get. Uh, this is not. Yeah. A, a cell a cell phone is not a great <laughs> great mirror. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, a lot of it's knowing a little bit more about how your hardware works. What are the what are the principles like for cameras? More light. You want more light. Lenses don't see like human eyeballs do. If your eyes think it's bright enough, it's probably not bright enough. If they think it's a little bit too bright in the room, it's probably okay. Maybe not. Uh, or for audio, you know, don't try to turn things up. If something's too loud, turn it down. Or if something's too quiet, turn the other stuff down. And, and, and that'll preserve the quality rather than trying to stretch stuff. And that's a good point, man, because, yeah, we're kind of in a, in a 
place now in audio, you know, they talk about the compression wars and all mm -hmm. this stuff, you know, that a lot of what you hear, because the radio, if you, uh, I, I have a radio background, and so yeah, radio, I, I you compress it, yeah. the living hell out of everything. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> you, you squash the hell out of everything to make it as loud as it possibly can be. And then so from an audio engineering standpoint, people try to make their tracks sound like that so that they're louder than everything else. Mm -hmm. But louder isn't always better, and especially in terms of when you're talking about something like uh, what we're talking about with gaming, with streaming, you want it to kind of fit well into the mix of things. And I guess there's no real way. I mean, that that's when you just have to learn to kind of trust your ears. Mm -hmm. And yeah, knowing your hardware is at least 50% of that battle, if not more. And then the rest of it is just through experience of doing that, mm -hmm. you will learn to trust your ears a lot more and, and you'll kind of find where those levels work well for yourself and, and for others i mean when you start bouncing it off of other people hey just what? a quick question how much time do we have left oh uh, we've got about 10 minutes 10 minutes although uh 10 minutes and then i need to work with jm who's going to be doing a musical performance for us so we'll do, be doing a handoff over to them oh how cool uh -huh, so we are having music on this program yes we Yay. are yes we are actually this is a pretty decent lead into that so uh, JM, we won't be actually broadcasting that from location here. JM will be patching in and broadcasting from wherever they are located. And actually, I believe we're actually going to see the sequencer and the synthesizer in use live as we're watching. So that should be pretty exciting. Ooh. I know, right? I know, right? That's really cool. Uh, but we do have a few more minutes. Uh, and so maybe let's talk a little bit about some principles to think about when you're working with sound for your game or, or you know... Mixing, like, the thing that I learned first was, you know, turn stuff down, don't turn it up. And it's okay to have things be quiet. Like, it's okay. I was, the compression wars where, where for recordings, people for years were trying to make everything louder so it popped when you listen to it on the radio. It, I listened to some early jazz albums recently and was like, they actually changed their volume. They play quiet yeah, dynamics, for a while. Yeah, dynamics, yeah. And, and the dy dy dynamics, yeah. Play quiet. And then... When something gets exciting, they come up, and you're like, wow, that's really cool. I, I, I feel it, you know? Building some of those emotions again. Yeah, and in sound effects, that that is a lot... It plays on the emotions, too, mm -hmm. because especially now you've got a lot of these horror games coming out where people, you know, stream themselves getting scared by amnesia or whatever. Uh, a lot of your jump scare stuff mm -hmm. kind of depends on those quiet moments punctuated by loud moments. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of have that broad range of things. And, and what we're doing with Hashtag Wrecked, I mean, it is an arena shooter. It's very much in the styles of things like your Quake and your Unreal and things that we have uh, seen in the past. But it's its own thing space wizards uh, battling for the benefit of the one percent it's uh the, i'm writing the lore right now sorry but yes uh, <laughs> yeah do, definitely you, do you're the gonna gameplay see... before you do the lore yeah we, we, we have yes <laughs> but yeah in coming to the sound part of it there is a lot of things where you know you want to especially with uh telling where somebody's at you know your your positional audio and things like that you know oh they must be far away i can hear the explosions from far away mm -hmm. oh it's uh, right next to me uh, it's right up close to me and, and so yeah you, your dynamics really come into play when uh, in game dev on those sorts of things mm -hmm. speaking of which that's another thing that i forgot uh when we were talking about stuff that was really interesting in in uh, in game audio are are the occasions where where a sound is tied to a location somehow, like like there's something playing on a radio somewhere, uh, you know, it's in, environment it, like something in the environment is is creating the sound. Uh, there are there are a few places that have done that really well, just like like the the, the old radio sound and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a a more indie example than the ones I can think of, of course, and yeah. it's just not coming to me as yet. But uh, that's it, it, it just falls, it it falls under the category. Yeah, just it, exactly. That's that's a good thing. Do it, guys. Mm -hmm. Do that. Put put audio in the scene. It it, it really livens it up and makes it interesting. Um, and anyway. the next thing you know, all the indie games that come out next year all have radios in the background. Radios. I'll take it. I'm you know, okay with it. <laughs> that'd be all right. You know, I I still 
if you were to if you were to play the the Sonic the Hedgehog drowning music, I would probably wake up in a cold sweat. No matter how deeply. Oh, gosh. Don't do it. You're killing me here. You're killing me. I'm gonna go have a panic attack. But yeah, that's a uh, that's a good point. Like not only linking a sound to a place, but also to a sort of feeling, like mm -hmm. an exact point in the game. Uh, if you have sounds that do exactly from like uh, like the dying sound or other stuff like that, if you have a sound that plays exactly at certain points in the game, you link a feeling to it, and I think that's really important in games as well, not just the music or the ambience or the environment. If I just if I just created the radio uh, the indie radio aesthetic movement in indie games, I'll be <laughs> I'll be happy. I'll be proud. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's look at about a year and see what games are coming out. What they do with sound. And they'll create it. They'll create it the second person to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just remind me one year from this day. Yeah, put, a, right. put a put a reminder on your calendar. Yeah. Um, let's see. On that note, I think we're gonna start winding this down. Uh, we're gonna take a few minutes to get ready for James' musical performance, and I'm gonna need to be involved in that. And I'm the only person here, so I can't be here and there at the same time. But well, Logic, I just want to, on behalf of everybody, want to thank you for uh, bringing us in and, and putting this together. It's been uh, hopefully informative. It certainly has for me. I've learned a lot just uh, talking to some of these great people. And, and just uh, we, we cover so much ground here. I mean, we've covered, you know, live broadcasting. We've covered uh, sound design. We've covered music composition. I mean, that's a lot in an yeah, hour. Yeah. And uh, so it's to a testament to it. Yeah. And so, just a great panel. I really enjoyed it. And uh, this whole Indie 3 thing is a great thing. And you're doing great work. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, who's been watching. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Hype. Absolutely. Thank I, you. I've enjoyed having all of you here, especially in that, you know, an hour before we did the panel, we said, we should do a panel on audio. And I'm like, well, we, we have a slot to fill at 7 o'clock. And <laughs> here we are, you know, an hour later. That, I, that's incredible. That's Indie 3 for you. I, I just right wanted on. to say, I just wanted to say that th when I got called for this panel, uh, my original idea was just basically uh, vintage sound hardware and why your song is not eight bit. And mm. I'm kind of glad that I didn't get to touch up on that because it would just be me hating on a lot mm. of stuff, and that would be very bad. <laughs> and and me resisting joining you because I've got kind of that same thing going if I don't pay attention to myself and check myself on it, dude, yeah. And me just joining you anyway, and the bottom line is there'll be a lot of hating, and then it'll just all fall apart. <laughs> exactly. But we, but we know that's not what this is about. By the way, you should actually try um, composing for, say, the knees or something and actually try pushing the limits of what you can do because that will um, help you through your, your other things. Yeah, definitely. Ooh, oh, I agree um, with pushing limits. Every, if, you, if, you're if you're not growing, what's the point, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. just, yes, uh, just real quick. Favorite uh, limit-pushing NES soundtrack, Tim Fallon's Solstice. If you haven't mm. heard it, we should, no, we should oh, find yes. it and link it. Dude, when I first heard that after after renting all these other games, I was like, "What in the world did they? Do? How did what? How did they do that?" Mm -hmm. Never found. found it. I it, just uh, found, trigger. found it. I just found the uh, title screen uh, music somewhere That's, on a list. Oh, okay. Yep, it's it's I it's well regarded. My favorite uh, NES soundtrack is probably Journey to Silius from Sunsoft, because how they used the sample channel from the NES to make the bass, and like no other game does that. Mm. Um, probably my favorite, I didn't have an NES, I had a Sega Master System. Yeah! Yes, yes me too. Um, me too. Oh, awesome. Um, but yeah, probably my favorite uh, piece that was ever made in a commercial game was the Sonic 2 uh, credits theme. Not the one that you're thinking of. You're probably thinking of the Mega Drive one. The Master System <laughs> one was quite different and oh. significantly more awesome. Someone else who played the Master System one. Not, it wasn't just me. Yeah. <laughs> I have sure, it too. Alex Kidd, man. Yeah. Alex oh, Kidd, yeah. yeah. I, man, I really hate Aqua Lake Zone X too. Hate it. <laughs> But yeah, um, the thing that was so amazing about that is you've got three note channels, and they managed to shove in the equivalent of a full note chord in there somehow. How? What? How? Black magic. I think you... Black magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I'll right. take that. 
All right. Well, I, th I think we're going to end it here. Uh, our musician is in the chat saying they're ready to go. So All right. I will. Stay tuned, everybody. Yes. Please stay tuned. I'm going to take everything down here and actually shut this stream down. That's expected. Nobody run away. It's not broken. It's it's still working. Just hang around. Stay here. Uh, and then we're going to have a live musical performance. So please look forward to that. We will be just a moment while we get set up. Thank you, everybody. Keep it locked. Sweet. Yeah. Good, good night, everybody. And again, thank you to our panelists for coming in on such short notice and bringing such a broad range of experience. This has been incredible. Thank you. And I feel like pleasure. we have been able to, like, like you said, address a lot of topics and hopefully gotten a lot of the indies out here interested in not in thinking about their audio and how it plays into the experiences that they're giving to their players or for the Let's Players or the streamers, kind of how they're presenting to their viewers and, and what they can do to enhance that. So thank you again. And this is Logical signing off. We will be back in just a moment with uh, with JM, WM, or Bojangles in the chat. So please look forward to that.